You guys ready to talk about some exciting things? Death, incapacity, that kind of thing? Um, so I'm Scott Robbins. I'm an estate and elder law attorney at Baron Rosenberg. Uh, we're in Troy. Uh, many of you have met uh, my partner, Don Rosenberg. Um, he and I do, <clears throat> excuse me, he and I do the exact same thing along with one of our other partners, uh, Danielle Mayoris. And my goal today is to inform you about some uh, higher level estate planning and elder law concepts. So first off, it's important to know what's the difference between estate planning and elder law. Elder law is for anybody who wants to get old. It's not necessarily for somebody who is old. It could be, but any time is the right time to implement estate planning. And there's some distinct differences that we consider when addressing elder law planning. The first thing that I always tell people is that you need some foundational estate planning. And that's always, for me, going to start with powers of attorney. And there's some differences that uh, relate to that. With regards to the two columns that you see in front of you, the left side is just your general run-of-the-mill estate planner's uh, concerns. And then we like to say that we kick it up a notch and we'll address some of the other concerns on the right-hand column. So your general estate planning uh, durable powers of attorney will either limit or uh, prohibit gifting altogether. When it comes to gifting, we want to be very careful because your money should be used for you. But we also want to make sure that our agents, whoever we have working for us, can manage our money in a way that can actually benefit us. And sometimes if we can reconfigure the way that our money is situated, we can avail ourselves of certain public assistance and make sure that we can receive the greatest quality of care at the least cost to ourselves and to our family members. Um, now, when it comes to elder law concepts, again, this is very, very complex and detailed. But the one thing that we want to make sure that you're aware of is what we call the unforgivable five-year look back. And if somebody needs a high level of care, usually one of our goals is to try and help them get assistance to pay for that care. The average cost of a nursing home in the state of Michigan this year is just under $10,000 a month. So $10,000 a month. If, if, you're, if you're in the home, it's quite a bit higher than that, somewhere between fourteen and 20000 per month. So the cost of care is crippling for almost anybody. When you look to qualify for benefits, one of the things that we have to address, have there been any transfers in the last five years? Because if there has been a transfer where somebody didn't receive equal value back, when they go to apply for these benefits, there's going to be a delay in the period between when they apply and when they can actually receive benefits. And so that's what we're referring to here. When it comes to what strategy you implement, this is the list of generally all the strategies that we would consider when we're meeting with a client. The most important thing to know is don't spend your money to zero. That's never a strategy. There's a whole bunch of different things we can do with trusts, with court. Um, the, the most uh, probably exciting one that we have is this one that says name on the check. That's where if there's an ill spouse who requires a high level of care, usually their um, their asset is gonna be counted as an asset for them. And in the best case scenario, we would have to transfer that to the well spouse. Well, if it's something like an IRA or a 401k, that would mean liquidating the account. And if it's several hundred thousand dollars, that could mean a couple hundred thousand dollars of taxes due. And so that's, even though you get, might be able to qualify for a benefit, it's very undesirable. So what this name on the check is referencing is that if you can actually communicate with the product company that manages that account, and you can get them to annuitize that account in the name of the well spouse, the public program won't actually view those checks as accountable asset for purposes of qualifying for the benefits. The payments that are coming to that well spouse are still counted as income, and so tax still might have to be paid, but if it's stretched out over the remaining spouse's lifetime, then it's going to be a much lessened tax hit, and it, everything will result much more positively that way. All right? 